Welcome to today's lecture. In this lecture, we're going to discuss conceptual models and user experience. The most important take-home message about this lecture is if the conceptual model is wrong, then the user is going to find it hard to use the interface. And so it's really important that you think about what the underlying conceptual model for the interface is from the start. The, uh, the key objective of this session is actually to help you understand exactly what a conceptual model is and what impact conceptual models have on user interfaces. I say you know, on this slide, aka, is a Kindle a book? Well, a Kindle is kind of a book in that it borrows the idea of a book, but it, is it more like a library because you have a whole bunch of books? Or is it a book? Is it something that facilitates you to read books? Um, it's all of those things really, but conceptually, the interface itself is book-like. It's designed to be held like a book when you're on holiday, when you're reading on, uh, the book on the beach. It's supposed to map to that underlying concept. So just so you know how this lecture is structured, here's an outline of the topics we're going to cover in the class. And again, as usual, here are the online resources. Do go away and read them because we can't cover in a short video lecture like this all of the detail that you need to know for the course and the coursework. So what is a conceptual model? Well, a conceptual model requires you to understand two things. And one is a mental model that is something very specific about a person's thought process. Um, about how a person thinks something works. They're based on incomplete facts, users' past experience, and even their own intuitive perceptions about how something works. They help shape the actions and behaviour and influence what people pay attention to in complicated situations. They also define how people approach and solve problems. So you have a specific mental model about how things work, like if I ask you, well, why is the sky blue? You might have a mental model about why the sky is blue. If you're trained in, um, in physics, atmospheric physics, you might have a better idea of why the sky is blue. Um, your mental model might be more refined, it might be more advanced, but ultimately, you know, you'll have a particular view about that. A four-year-old child will have a different mental model about why is the sky blue. So in UI design, it's really important to have a representation or counterpart of something that exists in the real world that you can map into, and that gives you a hook from the user interface perspective of a concept that will be easy to grasp by the user. The conceptual model is the model that you present to the user through the interface of the product. So you come up with um, what the overall overarching concept for the product is. For example, a book versus a Kindle. So a Kindle has um, a conceptual model, the interface of the Kindle has a conceptual model that relates to reading a book. Good conceptual models uh, uh, have a direct relationship to a good user uh, experience. If the conceptual model is easy to grasp, then the user interface is normally intuitive and easy to use. A bad conceptual model will actually cause a huge amount of frustration for the user. And later on, I'll show you an example where I encountered a really bad conceptual model for navigation in an application, and I'll explain why it was a bad conceptual model for me. The goal of the user interface should be really to signpost to the user what the right mental model and underlying conceptual model is. So the user's model develops through um, interaction with the system, but also is biased by any preconceived ideas and experience of related or similar products. So designers expect users' models to be the same as theirs, but you can't expect that because your expertise gets in the way of thinking about things from the user's perspective. So say a user um, 
is very heavily into game playing and you're developing a game but you are not into game playing but you happen to have got this job and you're developing a game engine uh, if you don't understand a bit about how users play games then the conventions and things that the users used to using in in typical gameplay won't be familiar to you so you won't adopt those in the in-game UI and that could prove problematic because then a person is less likely to adopt that UI and, think, and dismiss your game as being rubbish. So what happens when the model is bad? Um, the user will make mistakes, um, their performance will deteriorate, they're not going to be able to carry out various tasks in the most effective and efficient way, they're going to be unwilling to adopt the system and in the end they'll get frustrated and they'll probably just dismiss the system as being rubbish. Mental models come from previous experience as I've mentioned before and one way to think about that is in terms of metaphors. What is the metaphor, real world analog, in the interface of a particular interface object? What's the real world counterpart? So for example an on-screen keyboard has a real world counterpart, uh, counterpart in terms of a typewriter originally or um, a, a keyboard on a computer. We, we all have our models and beliefs about our own behaviour, the behaviour of people we interact with, how things around us behave and how software behaves. And our models change over time. So for example, I might have a scenario where I think at the moment that the most favourite application I use is Google Calendar. Maybe that's the application I use all the time. Maybe in about three years' time, somebody will come up with a much better calendar application and I'll switch over to using that. So then my most favourite application will be something else altogether. But I can't envisage that right now, so if you ask me, what's your favourite calendar application, I'll say Google Calendar. But that's transient. That may not be true forever. So if your interface makes some basic fundamental assumption about a, a user's model, about something in particular in the interface, then you've got to factor in that over time that model may also change. So here's the case study that I mentioned earlier. Um, I, have, uh, I took a transatlantic flight recently uh, and I was actually quite bored, as you get bored on a long haul flight and decided to look at the in-flight entertainment application. There was a touch screen and the in-flight entertainment thing looked a little bit more modern than some airlines have. And I was surprised to find that it had um, a more interactive map application compared to other in-flight applications that I'd seen. It looked a bit more recent, new, modern and you could do, you could zoom in on various areas and interactively have a look at what's going on, where you are in your flight, progress and things like that. So I decided to play with it but within a few minutes I completely dismissed it as rubbish because the navigation metaphor used in the application was completely different to the navigation metaphor I had become used to using Google Maps and Google Earth. If I hadn't had previous experience of using Google Maps and Google Earth typically then I probably would have found the interface okay. I might have even found it intuitive. But because it didn't match my mental model of how navigation in such applications should work, it didn't work for me. So here's an image of um, Google Earth. And as, you, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar, the, the navigation elements are quite different to the navigation elements on the previous screen. So ultimately a lot of people are asking the question how long are in-flight applica uh, application screens, um, in-flight applications going to be really useful for because they are quite dated compared to what people can do on their mobile devices. 
and people have been looking at trying to have in-flight entertainment applications on people's mobile devices. So at the end of the day, how long before the, uh, before the whole in-flight application thing becomes obsolete and people just start using their own mobile devices for in-flight entertainment? And according to various news sites and things like that, it seems to be sooner than you think. So maybe you'll see um, your first iPad in-flight entertainment system on a flight near you. Um, on an end note again, I'll leave you with this week's in-class practical task and think about it because again, your team is going to have to do this and present it to everybody else in class. So, see you next time. Bye. <laughs>